when we do finite element, what we do is we take partial differential equations, we multiply by a test function, and we integrate. So the core thing that we're going to need to be able to do is integrate functions over whatever domain we're solving the PDE over. And the elements part of finite element is we actually carve the domain up into a mesh. So we, uh, in two dimensions, we make uh, a mesh of triangles or maybe quadrilaterals. In this course, we'll do triangles. And on each triangle, then, we're going to need to be able to integrate the partial differential equation that we're using. And so the guts of that are, is we need to be able to integrate. Now, you've all learned how to integrate, um, but what we need to do is generically integrate whatever we are thrown. And it is possible to attempt to write symbolic integration packages that will take any input and integrate it. It doesn't work. So you could, for some cases of differential equations, we know what's in the integrand, work out the analytical integral on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and that would be your answer. But the generic answer is actually we'll do the integral numerically, because now we've got one recipe that says whatever is the PDE, whether it's uh, the left-hand side or the right-hand side, whatever term we're doing, we've got one recipe for how to do this. And how do we integrate uh, numerically? Well, this is called quadrature. And you may or may not have officially hit the term quadrature in your courses. You have all seen numerical quadrature because when you first learned how to integrate, they showed you numerical quadrature and then they did, took the limit of it and they got, you, you got an integral. And we'll see that in just a second. But this is absolutely not news. So the core idea of numerical quadrature is I've got an integrand. So the integrands are functions. So what I'm doing is I'm integrating some function of x, x is the spatial coordinate. Uh, we'll come back in a minute to y, it's big X. And uh, we're integrating it over some domain E. And so in quadrature, the only thing we're going to assume about the integrand f is it's a function that we can evaluate. So if you give me a point, I can tell you what the value of the function at that point is. And in numerical quadrature, we can approximate the integral as the weighted sum of the evaluation of the function at particular points. And um, so all we do is we define on a particular domain, a particular triangle, for example, that I want to integrate on, a set of those points, we derive the appropriate weights, and we evaluate the function at each quadrature point, and we multiply by the corresponding weight. So each point has its own weight. It can be a different weight for each point. And that is equal to the integration up to an error term. Because in effect, what we've done is uh, taken the Taylor series of the function, integrated the Taylor series, and chopped off. So this is exactly the same stunts that we pull all over numerical approximations in mathematics. So, um, because what we're doing is effectively truncating a, a Taylor series, we get a error term, which is the size of the element to some power. And actually, if the thing that I was integrating here is a polynomial of not too high degree, and we'll come back in a second to what not too high means, then I will have committed no error at all because that integration won't have any terms in the high order bits of the Taylor series. So actually, if what you're integrating is polynomial, and very, very often when we're doing PDEs using the final method, what we're integrating is polynomial, and we use enough terms in the Taylor series, which corresponds to using enough points with corresponding weights, then we actually get the answer. So we can do the integration with no error. Uh, and that's what we will do essentially universally in this course. If you're doing relatively low order finite elements, that's what you want. Uh, people who then do very high order finite elements, if you're doing do finite elements and you're approximating your function with 15th degree polynomials or something like that, then actually people play games where they approximate the integral with fewer points to make it cheaper. And that's a fine thing to do because all algorithms have error. We only care about what the most important error is. And so there's no point paying lots and lots and lots 
to integrate exactly if you're making a big error in your truncation or something like that. So, um, so we'll do that. So, um, if uh, so, the what counts as enough, and we won't go. I won't go through the derivation of what this is, but it's easy to find online. Um, is if you have a polynomial function f with degree p, and p is less than or equal to n minus two in one dimension, then you get a uh, sorry in, in any dimension that n is the truncation error, then you get exactly zero error. It's the, the the outcome, and so this p. The p such that we make no error is called the degree of precision of the quadrature rule. So quadrature rule of degree of precision p integrates degree p polynomials with no error. And if your polynomial is higher degree, there'll be an error somewhere. So we just said that. So I told you that you've already seen a numerical quadrature. And in fact, here's an example. So um, when you first... Um, learns how to integrate, then what you were probably shown, I'll draw this over here, which is unfortunate because the, the genius who redesigned this um, room decided that putting the whiteboard behind the screen was obviously the right move, and I whinged, so they put a whiteboard in. This is great. I apologize to anyone who's watching the uh, recording because the camera points that way. Um, so what you do is you say, well, if I have some function which is on the interval 0 to h, and I want to integrate that function, well, um, one thing I could do is I can just approximate this thing by a box, and I'm going to approximate it by a box whose height is the function value in the middle here. So this is the point h over 2. And I'm going to say that integral of the function of x is approximately equal to this value, so that's f at h over 2 times the width of the box, which is h. Right? That's a quadrature rule. And in fact, when you learned to integrate, you did it like that, right? Because you stacked a whole load of those up and you took the limit as h went to, went to 0. So the idea that we can do approximate integrals like that is not a huge surprise, and probably when you learn to integrate, someone also pointed out uh, that there's something called the trapezoidal rule. And the trapezoidal rule just says, well, I could have done this a bit better. Instead of having a box here, I could have chosen this point here and this point here and joined them up. So now that's not exactly a horizontal line. And so now I'm approximating this by a piecewise linear function. And what's the area under this? Well, that's just a triangle. So it's half the function here plus half the function here times the width. So that's h over 2 times the left end plus h over 2 times the right end. And if you work that one out, it's got a h to the 4 error term on it. And you can keep going up. So you might also have heard of something called Simpson's rule. So Simpson's rule says, well, yeah. instead of approximating the function by a constant or approximating by a linear, I'll approximate it by a quadratic function. And in order to specify a quadratic function, I need three points. And the obvious and symmetric three points are this end, the other end, and the point in the middle. And if you write out what the integral of a quadratic is, you discover that the weights you need are h on 6 to h on 3 and h on 6. So um, you've seen examples of quadrature rules all over the place. That's an integration rule on the interval 0, h. In my domain, I'm going to have a whole bunch of elements. And um, in 1D, I will have a bunch of little intervals that make up my domain that I'm using, which are in different places. And maybe different intervals have different lengths. And in 2D, it's much more complicated than that. right? So not only are the triangles in different uh, points in space and with, of different size, but also they're a different shape, right? They're different angles in them, because I might have a very strange shaped domain that I'm trying to make up out of triangles, for example. And so that now starts get a bit, getting a bit painful, because 
what we've got are quadrature rules that are written out in terms of something like the interval 0h, or maybe the unit interval 0, 1, or uh, sometimes people use a different uh, base interval, which is minus 1 to 1, because then symmetries work out nicely. So what we actually do as a practical matter is we work out the quadrature rule on what we call a reference element. So the reference element might be a unit interval, or it, for a triangle, uh, it's very common to use a right angle triangle with two sides of length 1. That's a very simple reference triangle. And we're going to work out how to integrate on that triangle. And then every time we want to do an actual integral that's somewhere off on a different triangle, we'll change coordinates so that we're on this triangle, and now we know how to do the integration. So maths, problem, maths 101, turn the problem into a problem that we solved earlier. And um, so we are going to do that in uh, this course. We will use uh, the unit interval in one dimension, so the interval from 0 to 1, and the unit triangle um, whose vertices are the origin, the point x is 1, the point y is 1, and diagonal. So those are actually the only things we're going to integrate over. And um, actually, I'm not going to get you to derive quadrature rule because that's a different game. Uh, it's not the subject of uh, today's symposium, as they say. Um, and so I've nearly given this bit to you. So before we look at those, we'll look at some of the things we're going to build this up from. So if you uh, are not familiar with object-oriented programming, this is the bit where this is going to start uh, to, you're going to start to bump into this. So what the aim of the game here is that we make our software library up out of software constructs which look like the maths contract constructs. Because then by understanding the maths and understanding what we mathematically want to do, we can just pick up the corresponding software pieces and use them as you would use the maths pieces. And now we have a well-structured piece of code that a mathematician will understand and that we can debug, and life is a great thing. So we're going to have reference cells. So we're going to have software objects that correspond to those reference cells. And all the way through the documentation, every time we encounter the name of a uh, software object, it's linked to the documentation of that software object. So if we click on reference cell, we discover that in the FE Utils module that we saw yesterday, there is a reference elements module which contains reference cell. And a reference cell is made up of a set of vertices and a topology and a name. And name I haven't documented because it's sort of obvious. Uh, vertices is a list of coordinate vectors corresponding to the coordinates of the vertices of a cell. OK, so if it's a unit interval, it's going to be the list containing the one vector 0 and the list containing the one vector 1. Be, be very careful here. When we do maths with a, with a pen and paper, we use the implicit identity between one vectors and scalars all the time, and we just treat one vectors like they're scalars. Computers don't play games like that. You have to be very, very clear in your mind as to whether the thing we're currently doing is really a scalar or is really a one long vector, and you'll get tripped up all over the place if you fail to make that distinction. So when I have the unit interval, um, it's got two vertices at the end of it, Vertices have coordinates, and coordinates are vectors. They're still vectors in 1D. So the vector of one end is 0, the vector of the other end is 1. Um, in 2D, I've got three points, and they're 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, or maybe the other way around. And it's got a topology. And what's a topology? Well, a cell is actually made up of um, geometric or topological uh, objects. So there's the cell itself, and then in two dimensions, the cell has um, edges, and uh, it also has vertices. And so this thing, we're going to come back later to how it's actually made up mathematically, but it records which vertices are associated with which edges. That's uh, something that turns out to be quite important. It's also got a whole load of other information here that we might need to use at some point, but we don't need to use yet. 
You can also click on source and it will actually show you the source code. We don't need to discuss that one right at this instant, so, but we'll come back. It's important you know the stuff is there. Now, we've got a reference cell class, so that's a type of object, but we actually also need to deal with individual uh, instances of that object because we've got a reference interval and a reference triangle. So there is an object called reference interval, and reference interval is a reference cell storing the geometry and topology of the interval 0, 1, and reference triangle is the same thing for this next one. So if we look at the source again, um, here's the reference inter interval. So here you can see when we passed in, we pass in a list of vectors. And here there's a list of vectors as well. And then there's the topology that we don't need to talk about, and it's got a name. Simple as that. Okay, so having built some reference elements, we can write quadrature rules, and as we noticed earlier, a quadrature rule is actually a really simple object. It consists of two lists. One is the list of points, where you're gonna evaluate the function, and the other one is the list of weights, where you're, which you're going to multiply by the evaluation of the function at each of those points. So, for example, for Simpson's rule, which is the simplest example of a quadrature rule where all the weights aren't the same, um, the points are 0, half, and 1, and uh, the weights are 1 third, 2 thirds, and 1 six. So that's all you need to encode a quadrature rule. That's its in entire existence. Um, the simplest one on a triangle is the piecewise constant quadrature, so that only takes one point. The one point by symmetry is the point in the middle of the triangle, which on our reference triangle is the point 1 third, 1 third, and it has a weight of one half. The weights of a quadrature rule always sum to the volume of a reference element. I will leave as an exercise for you to work out why that has to be true. You can work out why that's true, you'll understand something about this. So, it's um, one of the nice things about the finite element method as opposed to say finite differences or finite volume is we can change the approximations, um, how well our solution approximates the real solution by just turning up the degree of the polynomials. And that's just a parameter you can turn, nothing much else changes. But of course that means that we're gonna need more and more and more quadrature points. So really what we don't wanna do is write out 50 million quadrature rules. What we want to do is have a recipe for what the quadrature rules are. And it turns out that there are several such recipes in one dimension, and so, uh, the Legendre Gauss quadrature rules, or sometimes people call them Gauss Legendre quadrature rules, depending on who you think is first, um, do this for us. Uh, they are um, simply the roots of a Legendre polynomial on the points, and then you can derive what the weights that correspond to those points are. Um, and so, in 1D, that's great. This is an optimal quadrature rule which means that um, it's, for each degree of precision, it has the fewest number of points possible for any quadrature rule. So that's a nice thing, because it's sort of a bit quicker. We don't really care about speed in this case. Okay, so that's 1D. We are going to do everything in this course in 1D and 2D. Uh, the reason we do that is because uh, it encourages you to think about what the structure of the problem is, such that you're really solving the generic case, not a specific case. Uh, we could also do 3D. The problem with 3D is uh, something called cursive dimensionality. So the amount of uh, computation power you need to solve a problem is exponential in the dimension. And so once we start doing 3D, things get very, very expensive very quickly. And we want to understand the, the uh, structure of the problem. Where this is not an a high performance computing course where we want to burn supercomputer time to solve big problems, right? That's a, that's, that's a different course. And uh, so we won't bother doing 3D because it's not really different from 2D in that respect and it's just expensive. So we'll do one and 2D. Okay, so to do 2D, um, there aren't, so, it's not so straightforward to just cook up the roots of a polynomial in 2D and have a optimal quadrature rule. 
There are some good quadrature rules. They get a bit complicated. But if the element I wanted to use in 2D was a square, there'd be a simple answer. Because a square is basically the Cartesian product of one interval with another interval. So if I take a quadrature rule on one interval and a quadrature rule on the other interval, I can take their product and get a new quadrature rule that works in 2D. And the product in this sense is that the weights are multiplied and the points are formed by taking the point from this, the x point and the y point. So that's how a Cartesian product works out. So that's great, and I can do tri uh, quads. We don't want to do quads. Uh, the reason we don't want to do quads is because meshing with quads is inconvenient, and um, meshing with triangles is much easier. So when we do 2D, we're going to do triangles. But that means we need a quadrature rule on triangles, which is um, a uh, which is a slightly different different proposition. Fortunately, I've already mentioned the solution to this problem. The solution to this problem is we'll just change coordinates. So we'll just change coordinates into a coordinate space where our square is a triangle. So this is called the Duffy transform. And the Duffy transform simply says, I'll change coordinates so that the length of this side is 0. And now I've got a triangle. Uh, that works so long as your quadrature points aren't actually on the boundary. Because if they are on the boundary, you just squash a whole bunch of them onto one spot and bad things happen. Fortunately, the Gauss-Legendre quadrature points are all interior to the domain. Life's great. Uh, so this is how we do it. Um, when we um, do this calculation, what we discover is that we've multiplied by this linear function. And so what that does is actually means that to the quadrature rule, it looks like our integrand is a slightly higher degree polynomial than we thought. We've effectively multiplied the integrand by a linear function. So it's one higher. And so you have to use one more degree of precision in one direction. OK. So now we're getting to the real bit. So the. FE utils quadrature module. OK, so how are we going to uh, find that? So if you click on here, this does give you the documentation of the quadrature rule um, class. And uh, if we look at its source, boom, then here we find the integrate method that that page was talking about. And we find it's not in implemented. So. Yep, that's what we're going to do. And, but I can't implement stuff on the website. So as we saw yesterday, what we're going to do is open up our individual copy of this file and edit it. Um, so let's do that. So what I need to do is... Um, Go to my software hub, softwarehub.imperial.duck, and I'm going to open Atom, which, if you remember, is the editor that we're going to use, unless you're choosing to use a different editor. This is where I'm going to get myself in trouble, because I really seriously don't use Atom. I use Emacs, and so I'm going to do this all wrong, but that's a risks of uh, public coding. Here we go, here's Atom starting up. Um, and in fact, I opened up the project yesterday so we can still find it. But if you haven't already opened this, what you do, it's got a file menu. We can say open file, and hopefully here you'll have a directory called your username. In there, you've probably got a finite element course, or whatever you called yours. And in there, there's an FE utils directory, and in there, there's quadrature. So that's what we're going to open. So here is that integrate method in my uh, um, text editor where I can actually change it. Before I let you loose to change it, to, to edit it, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, I mentioned yesterday that we're doing test-driven development. 
So you also already have the tests that should pass if you have successfully implemented this uh, method. And if we go back to the web page, it tells you a test script for your method is provided in the test directory as test01 integrate.py. Run this script to test your code. Okay, so what I need to do is back in the software hub, I'm going to run git, because you'll remember yesterday, git gives us a nice command line that we can use to run tests and everything else that we need. I'm going to change into my finite element course directory, and um, I need to activate my virtual environments. Oh, I'll type source. Sorry, keep taking shortcuts at the beginning. Excuse you. Right. Okay. So my. Uh, my Pavlova reaction triggers because I've got, I can see the end here and I can see implementation over there, so I know I'm in the right place. And now I do what it said on the website. So what did it say on the website? I say, pytest test slash um, ah, I think I'm going to get caught out by a Windows trick here, but that's okay, let's just do this. Um, Okay, and it's thinking about it, and oh, here we go. Being a bit slow. So, PyTest is running, right? It says test session starts. Um, it's just ground to a halt for some reason. Here we go. Look at that. All Fs. Um, oh, it's running, uh, okay, so what happened is I failed all of the integration tests, and now it's spewing out uh, information about every single test that I failed. Why did I fail all the integration tests? Well, because I don't have an integration method, that's expected. Um, what you probably want to do is pass the dash x option. What the dash x option does is it tells PyTest to stop on the first failure. And that's a lot more useful because I'm a nice person and I have basically ordered the tests in increasing complexity. So as you go through, you would want to pass the tests in order. And so what happens here is I fail on the first test, it stops immediately, and this is what's called a backtrace. So when you're running a computer program, what basically happens is you start running the main program, and then the main program calls a function, and that function calls a function, and that function calls a function. So at any given time, you are somewhere down this stack of functions that goes all the way up to the top. And so when the program dies, uh, it spews out a backtrace, and a backtrace starts from the top and shows you where you were in the main program, and then it shows you where you were in the function you called, and all the way down to where you are. So in this case, there was just the main test file, and the main test file, which is this bit, called integrate here, and here's the section on integrate, and integrate died because it's supposed to die, because all integrate does is raise an L. So now's the bit where you're actually going to code this. So, what you've got is integrate takes two arguments. It takes two arguments because it's a method of the quadrature rule. The first argument is called self. A method is a function which is associated with an object. Methods always take a first argument called self, and that argument self is the object itself. 
So in this case, that is the quadrature rule. That's important because the quadrature rule has points, self dot points, which you're going to need, and it's got the self dot weights, which you're going to need, which are number arrays of these things. And the other thing you've got here is the function you're going to integrate. So those are the only three things you need, right? So all you've got to do is evaluate the function at each of these points, multiply by the weights, add them up, and return the result. I'm now actually going to show you how to do this one. This is the only time in the course when I will show the, show the whole class how to implement uh, one exercise, because um, the point at this point is to get it to the point where everyone understands what we're doing. Uh, once we start doing fun elements next week, the, the, there's more maths in what we're doing. It becomes a bit more significant, because this is pretty trivial maths, right? So, um, all I need to do here is um, return, what do I need to return? It's the, um, yeah, there we go. Um, so, um, it's the dot product of, and I need to apply the function at each point x for x in self dot points. I think that'll do. So for those of you who haven't seen this bit of Python before, that thing's called a list comprehension. So I wrote square brackets to make a list, and then I use set theoretical notation. So I say things in the um, set for values of this in that. And so what I now need to do is save. Thing is, save. And do this again. Boom, hundred and five test passed. So that's the, uh, by the time you get to the end of this course, you'll just be sitting there looking at PyTest Run going, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Oh, no. Um, right, so, so we've actually now written some code. So that means that there's a file in your repository on whichever computer you're currently working on, which has changed. At the moment, that's all that's happened. Git doesn't know on your current computer, it's also not on GitHub. So this is in a very, very dangerous situation because if you subsequently edit the file and make a mistake, you may never be able to work out what it was you did right in the first place. Okay, in this case you could because it's trivial, but you know, as we get into more complicated steps, that's gonna be a problem. And if you lose your laptop, delete the directory, whatever happens, it's gone. So we want to do two things. We want to commit to the Git repository locally, and we want to push up to GitHub so that it's safely up in the cloud, and you can't lose it. And if you choose to get it, log it uh, out on one of your home computers or whatever, it's there for you. So what do I do? So git status. So if you got an error right now, it's almost certainly because you're not currently in your Git repository. Um, if you didn't do that, then you'd see something like this. And what does it say? It says, on branch implementation, yes, I knew that. Uh, your branch is up to date with origin implementation. So what that means is that the local version of uh, the Git repository is currently the same as the one online, so everything's good. Changes not staged for commit. So I have changed this file. Well, I knew that, I just saved it. Uh, if I type git diff, uh, it'll actually tell me what the difference is. Look at that, it tells me I deleted the line raise not implemented error, and I added the line return this. 
So that's the change that I want to have in Git. So I can see people craning in it, so I will just readjust this to whoever designed this room didn't think this through. Uh, is that a bit better? Um, so what I need to do is commit the change to the repository and then push those changes up to GitHub. So to commit, I use git commit. Dash A is for commit every file that Git knows about, so I don't have to specifically tell it which files because I'm lazy. Also, Git will enforce that you put a comment on every commit message. So if you just run git commit dash A, it will pop up an editor and you have to edit into the file, it's a bit of a pain. The easier way to do it is to provide a message on the command line. And the way you do that is you say git commit dash A M, and then I give the message. So the message is a string which I put in quotes and The um, message is implemented integrate. Return. One file changed, yep. One insertion, one deletion. Yeah, we just saw that. I deleted the line raise not implemented error. I put in the line return whatever. So now when I type git status, which is my favorite command of all time, I will remember to bring some Git cheat sheets next time and I'll post them to the, the, the class. Um, so now it says, on branch implementation, yep, your branch is ahead of origin implementation by one commit because there's one commit locally that doesn't exist in GitHub. Um, and then there are no changes. So uh, this is just saying, and these are the files that I'm not looking at. And this file, if you care, is a technical file to do with the way Python works. Um, I can explain offline to people what that actually does if they really want to know. And so now um, what I need to do, why does this keep inserting still there? Uh, so now what I need to do is push, which I do by typing git push. And it spewed a whole load of stuff out. But uh, the interesting line is the end one, which tells you that it pushed the implementation branch here up to the implementation branch somewhere else, implementation to implementation. So now when I type git status, on branch implementation, your branch is up to date with origin implementation. Nothing's changed. So I'm done. Uh, as a very last thing, I will go to GitHub probably logged out. Oh no, I'm logged in, that's good. And here is my finite element repository. You guys should probably only got one repository on the left, so it's kind of easy for you. Um, and it can see that I, your recently pushed branches, I pushed the implementation branch one minute ago. Now if I click on the implementation branch, so now you can see here it showed branch implementation. It tells you that the last commit is implemented integrals. And if I click on FE utils and quadrature, I can see that indeed there, let me make that a lot bigger, there is the stuff that I wrote on my computer. So it obviously has been pushed up to GitHub, Git now knows about that. So it's safe and it's there. And if it were the end of the course, what would happen is the thing that you would post, paste into um, um, here we go. You would paste that magic huge number, which is actually a cryptographic hash of the commit information, into Blackboard, and I would be able to find that this is the version of the code you wanted me to mark. <laughs>